Hello. Ah, is that better? I s still feel there's an, uh, an echo. Okay, good. Finally, welcome to this event, which we're calling the Booker at 50. Um, I, uh, my name's Derek Johns. I'm a member of the uh, advisory committee of the Booker Foundation, which administrates the prize. And I'm delighted to be joined by Eleanor Catton, whose second novel, The Luminaries, won the prize in 2013. And by Stuart Kelly, writer and critic, who was one of the judges who awarded her the prize. And as you can see, they're sitting, <laughs> sitting very cosily together. And Stuart, I don't think you know, but I was the person who put your name forward as a judge. I don't think you know no, that, No, I do not. No. <laughs> I hope I didn't let you down. <laughs> um, the Booker Prize was first awarded in 1969 to an author called P.H. Newby. Um, and by the way, our uh, celebrating 50 years of the Booker this year in 2018 may seem like celebrating the uh, millennium in 1999, but there have been 50 winners. Um, it was the idea of a publisher, Tom Mashler of Jonathan Cape, who felt that Britain should have a prize of the stature of the Pulitzer in America and the Goncourt in France. And his colleague, Graham C. Green, persuaded a food company called Booker McConnell to be the sponsors. And the first few years were pretty quiet until 1972, when it was won by a writer called John Berger, who was much better known for his art criticism than for his fiction, but who'd written a novel called G. And uh, in protest at the activities of the Booker uh, company in the sugar trade in the Caribbean, he donated half of his prize to the Black Panthers, which is pretty strange when you think about it, um, all round, half the prize, the Black Panthers, and so on. Anyway, it was a controversy. It was the first book of controversy. Um, the book really took off in the 1980s. In 1980, the two Favourites were, uh, were William Golding and, um, uh, and Anthony Burgess. Burgess stated that he wouldn't attend the prize dinner unless he was told beforehand that he'd won. Probably in consequence, he didn't win. Golding <laughs> took the prize. Uh, in 1981, Salman Rushdie won it with Midnight's Children. And the idea that the empire writes back was born, you know, the huge contribution subsequently that writers from former Commonwealth, former empire countries have made to, uh, to, to English language fiction. Uh, and it began to be televised by the BBC. For quite a few years, the dinner was televised by the BBC, which is pretty deadly, actually. Uh, and uh, it, fortunately, it isn't anymore. Watching a lot of people in black tie having dinner is not very exciting. Uh, in 2002, a company called The Man Group became the sponsors. And uh, the prize was henceforth known as the Man Booker. Uh, now, for reasons of history and economy, I'm just going to refer to the Booker. The Man Group uh, is a wonderful sponsor, but let's just, let's just refer to the Booker. Um, literary prizes are controversial. They're inherently controversial. They're controversial because they're bound to be subjective. Who really knows who, what the best novel of the year is? Uh, and they're specifically controversial for the choices the judges make. Usually, actually, more controversial for the omissions they make than for the, for the actual choices. Um, writers have mixed feelings about them. Julian Barnes described the uh, book as posh bingo after he'd lost. And then, uh, after he won, he stopped talking about posh bingo. Don't know if any of you saw the Garden Review section this morning, but we, he was one of the writers extolling the, the virtues of the, of, of the prize. Anyway, we three are going to talk about the prize from our three different perspectives. And I'm going to start by asking Eleanor about the experience of winning the biggest prize in the three prize in, in the country. Um, Eleanor, your first novel, The Rehearsal, was short, was won, I was in Warren, uh, the Betty, Prask, Betty Trask Prize, 
which, uh, though a significant prize, doesn't have quite the distinction of, of the Booker. So you went in to, to that night, that dinner, uh, in 2013, the youngest, I think the youngest ever shortlisted author. You're certainly the youngest ever winner, but I think you're the youngest ever shortlisted author. Um, and what were your feelings uh, before, and what were your, were your feelings after? <laughs> Well, um, oh, thanks all for coming. Um, so great to be here. I've never been to this part of London before. It's so beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, that in many ways, literary prizes have come to take the place that was once occupied by, by critics. Um, a kind of a handful of, of people acting as kind of tastemakers, um, uh, uh, you know, in a kind of a, a, a kind of a who's in and who's out capacity, um, and I, I, I feel quite. I, I suppose as a reader, I feel quite um, differently about prizes than I do as a as a writer. <laughs> um, which which leads to the question we'll come to later of what who are prizes for? Are they for readers or writers or publishers, as publishers sometimes suggest? Uh, but we'll come back to that. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I frankly was just, I have, I have almost no memory of the night of the Booker Prize. But <laughs> I, my, my husband, who was with me that night, um, recently bought a tuxedo for the first time because he had a rented tuxedo on the night. And he said, did I have a wing collar on the night of the Booker Prize or, or no wing collar? And I said, I have, I have no idea you, that you were even present. You know, <laughs> I just, there's just this kind of white wall of, of, of terror. Um, I, I was very unprepared, I think, for the level of exposure, especially kind of now in more recent years, that the, that the, the even the long listing and the short listing brought with it. Um, yeah, so I kind of a, a, a sense of kind of nauseated terror, I, I guess, would be how I would Hillary <laughs> describe Mantel, my experience of that night. Hilary Mantel said, "You wake up the next morning in a different world. Everything has changed." Yeah, well, actually, in my experience, um, you, I, I got back from the after party at about 4 o'clock in the morning, and a taxi picked me up at 6 o'clock to do the BBC the today, World Service, today in the, program, the Today yeah. program in the morning. And then I had 13 hours of interviews the next day, ending with television at night. Yeah. Um, and I think I was probably still drunk for actually <laughs> maybe half the day the next when, day. When Graham Swift won in 1996 with Last Orders, he uh, went straight from the after party to the Today program. And when John, John Humphreys asked, asked him how he felt, he said, uh, I have absolutely no idea how I feel. <laughs> All I know is I'm very, very drunk. <laughs> <laughs> you were in a daze yeah. that night, but you managed to uh, give a wonderful speech, a very coherent and, and thoughtful speech. I was surprised to, uh, reading The Guardian uh, uh, this morning that several of the writers claimed, they made two claims. First is they all claimed they didn't think they were going to win. There has to be some disingenuousness there. Uh, and they all claimed that they hadn't prepared a speech. And I'm sure there must be some disingenuousness there. But you, you gave a lovely speech, I remember. Well, the, yeah, I, d I did prepare a speech. Yeah. But the, um, again, my husband was under instructions to destroy it. In the event that I didn't win, he was going <laughs> to go into my handbag and destroy it without me knowing. So I'd never have to look at it after, after the fact. Um, but that was reason, mostly just for reasons of self-protection, because I'm not very good in a kind of... In <laughs> I'm not very good at extemporizing. You, you spoke about 13 hours of interviews. Um, the roller coaster doesn't end there, because then, of course, you're expected to travel all around the world, um, quite often repeating yourself, um, and, of course, having much less time to write. And a lot of writers have been very concerned uh, that, the, uh, that in the short term, there's quite a deleterious effect on, on their work. Mm -hmm. How was that for you? Let, let's talk about the, the entire year after you won it. Your year of your reign. Yeah, I, um, I, I met um, Jan Martel actually just, just after, the, um, after the prize in 2013, and he said, you're about to lose two years of your life, so just don't, don't try and do anything for two years. And I thought, oh, well, maybe, like, let's see. But he was completely right. Um, I, I, I kind of, yeah, just an extraordinary amount of travel. Um, yeah. Kind of the, the the media requirements are, are quite yeah. they're quite punishing really yeah, in a way. Sure. I mean they're they're also it's a it's an incredible opportunity. So it's yeah, yeah. it's a it's a cool way to meet readers around the world who 
for whom the prize means quite a different thing. And yeah, they've got different perspectives. Um, they, they, and, they, and they bring such different things to your work as well. Yeah, so sure, it's, sure. It's, um, it's definitely sure. an education, but it's, sure. um, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, a, a, yeah. It, it, it cuts both ways, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, a roller coaster. <laughs> um, you mentioned Jan Martel. Um, I used to be a literary agent, and um, I, I have... Uh, four author experiences that um, I thought I might mention. One of one of was, was, was one was with Jan. Um, I used to have a little homily that I gave all my authors at the drinks party before the dinner, which went like this: It's a great distinction to have been shortlisted for the Booker Prize. From here on, of course, it's a complete lottery. And when I said this to Jan Martel, he looked at me as though I were out of my mind and said, "I want to win." Um, <laughs> And uh, I also had Rehinton Mystery shortlisted that year, which was a bit awkward. And um, when Rehinton lost, trying to console him, I said, you know, you're still the only author to have been shortlisted for all of your novels, in his case, three novels. And he looked at me as though I were out of my mind and said that I'm not coming again. <laughs> um, and then there was the author who I won't name, who the first year he was shortlisted and didn't win, turned to me and said, I could really have used the money uh, and was pretty philosophical. And then the second time he was shortlisted, he was the favorite, but he was pipped to it. And he said he was humiliated. And when I suggested to him that he wasn't humiliated, he was disappointed, he said, I'm humiliated. <laughs> so this is the kind of effect that, um, that uh, the book of us can have on, on writers. Um, Stuart, may I turn to you now? Um, Stuart is uh, a writer and critic. Uh, he was the literary editor of Scotland on Sunday. Uh, he uh, has written three books, one about Walter Scott, one called The Book of Lost Books, and the most recent, The Minister and The, and the Murderer. Um, I just want to read you something that A.L. Kennedy, before, you, I, uh, before I, I ask you about your, your thoughts on this, um, A.L. Kennedy was, a, a, pro, uh, was a, a, a judge in 1996 when Graham Swift won it. Uh, she described it afterwards as a pile of crooked nonsense, the winner determined by who knows who, who's sleeping with who, who's selling drugs to who, who's married to who, and whose turn it is. Um, Jonathan Kerr, who was also a judge afterwards, said he knew the reason for this statement was, was that he, he, she wanted Margaret Atwood to win and Graham Swift won in the event. Um, Stuart, tell us all about being a judge of, of, the, of the Booker Prize from the inside. <laughs> well, the strangest thing about judging the Booker Prize is that you read books in a way that nobody else does. I mean. Let me just ask the audience, how many of you have read a book that has won the Booker Prize three times? <laughs> yep. Uh, you don't count. You don't count. <laughs> oh, no, no, who excellent has... choice. You won. Possession. Really? That's the strange thing about it, is that most people, most readers, will not read the book three times. And when you're actually judging it, part of the curiosity of the experience is how can a book actually withstand being read more than once, more than twice? Uh, I think it's why certain genres have traditionally not done too well at the Booker. You know, crime novels, for example, are <laughs> <laughs> or indeed comic novels I mean uh, Steve Toltz who I think is a, a great writer a joke's got to be really funny to be funny three times um, <laughs> and yet we're aware at the same time that the actual people who are going to go into bookshops and give over the hard earned money for the book are probably not going to read it with the same level of depth that we have had to do. So in that way, it's always struck me as a very ambiguous proposition. And one of the reasons why I think Elner won, by the way, I will tell you this, um, when I read the first page of the luminaries, I thought, this is going to be the winner. <laughs> Absolutely on the first page. Oh, awesome. um, but you know, the first time I read it, I read it as being a book which was a very clever, 
imitation of 19th century fictions. The second time, I looked at how the astrological structures and the uh, mathematical structures worked through it. So that gave me something else, rather than just mm -hmm. enjoying the romp aspect of it. And the final time, it was just, this is a book about love. You know, it was the emotional core of it. Um, I have read it four times now. <laughs> uh, and every, me, <laughs> <laughs> well, every time I go back to it, I find something else in it. And that's all you can ask for a book, is that it's the gift that keeps on giving. Now, Stuart, you had two uh, quite academically inclined fellow judges, Robert McFarlane, who was the chair, and, uh, and, and Robert Douglas Fairhurst. And you had two broadcasters, Natalie Haynes and uh, Martha Carney. Um, describe, the, describe the process. Um, I mean, how, how, were, how were judgments arrived at, and, and, and how were sta uh, stages uh, reached, and so on? Well, I, I, I have to pay tribute to Robert McFarlane, who was an absolutely excellent chair. And right at the beginning, a question was posed, which was, you know, the booker um, in the pack that you get says it's about what is the best novel in the judge's decision of that year that has been submitted. But what best means is actually quite a difficult question. Mm -hmm. And the question that we sort of posed to each other was, would we like something which was perfectly formed, but perhaps a bit ambitious, a, a bit unambitious, mm -hmm. or something that was ambitious, but could be a bit raggedy? We didn't actually have to make that decision in the end, <laughs> because you know, your kind of clockwork beauty of that book seemed to satisfy both sides of it. But it did mean that, you know, there were books like the, uh, the Ozeki, which I thought was extremely good, but was a bit raggedy, and something like the Colm Toy Bean, which was perfectly formed, and yet didn't seem to move things forward. Mm. I mean, the question I always put each time was, how does this novel make the novel a bit bigger on the inside? You know, how does it change the nature of the novel? And unless a book is going to make the novel something more capacious, something bigger, then I don't see the point of the mm. prize. Mm. Well, let's talk about the point of the prize, because this is uh, always in, in contention. Uh, literary prizes, as I said, are, are inherently controversial, and, and the booker is more controversial than most. Um, who who are literary prizes for? Writers, readers, or some other party? I, I feel like as a reader, I I find them quite helpful, simply for spurring arguments among my friends, <laughs> uh, kind of provoking <laughs> outrage, and and um, and also a kind of a sense of in interest that kind of gives a it gives a, a a quality to the year. You know, you look forward to um, uh, sh long lists and short lists coming out, mm. and you you. I don't think anybody ever feels entirely on side with every decision that's ever made of every prize. And so it's quite, it's quite interesting to um, kind of hone your own critical judgment against, um, sure. against the decisions that are made. Sure. Um, I also kind of think that there's a, there's a way in which um, a, a critic is not... Th there's no requirement that a critic needs to be Catholic in his or her tastes. Um, you know, I, I can have a pretty good idea about what kind of novel James Wood is going to like, because I know I feel like I know his taste his pretty, own. <laughs> pretty, pretty well. Um, but I think that the a prize is quite different. There is actually a requirement of of catholicity or um, diversity when you see the prize over time. Mm. Um, I think that if a prize were to award um, a similar kind of author or to reward a similar kind of book year after year, we would start getting a bit. I, I think we, we would resist that yeah. as a culture. We would kind of think that that prize needed to um, kind of have a makeover or needed mm -hmm. to kind of um, uh, expand its sense of, 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 of what value mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's actually a really interesting thing. Yeah. Um, o o over time, I think it means that you can, you can see, probably for better and for worse, what, where the kind of cultural 
pulses. You can kind of take the cultural temperature from a literary prize much more than you can from the the career of a critic. Yeah, sure. Um, Stuart, who who do you think literary prizes are for? I would have to confess that when we were judging it, we never thought about it. Mm. Um, as somebody who writes for the newspapers, I used to say to aspiring journalists, if you write this with the intention of um, making some pointed remark to the author or to the publisher or to the agent, that is not right. Mm. Our one and only uh, obligation is towards our readers uh, to both inform them of what the book is like and hopefully to entertain them. But we never thought about you know, who the prize was for. In a way, the prize was, for me, it was the book that I liked best. For you and your fellow judges. Yeah. For, for me yeah. and my fellow judges. Yeah. And, you know, it was actually a year in which there was a unanimous decision. Yeah, sure. Um, we didn't have to do any horse trading. You can always tell a year where there's been horse trading. Yes. Well, if you go back to the original mission statement of the prize, it was, this is a slightly old-fashioned uh, phrase now, but to attract the intelligent general audience. Um, but in my mind, uh, as someone who's been involved with it for the last 10 years, it, it is a prize for readers. I mean, the, the point of it is to, is to introduce to readers books they wouldn't otherwise have been introduced to, and I think it's that simple. I think that a distinction can be made between a prize like the Betty Trask and other prizes that don't have the same visibility. And I'm thinking of the Encore Prize for the best second novel, Somerset Maugham Prize for a writer under 35 and so on. You could say those prizes are for writers. They are to encourage writers. They are to promote careers. But I think when it comes to the Booker, and I'd, I'd add the Costa and the Women's Prize, uh, I think these prizes are really, are really for, for readers. And that leads us, I think, to um, come back to the question of controversies, because there are two controversies that surround the Booker which I'd like to, uh, to consider. Um, and the first is gender. Um, there is uh, a strong suggestion, uh, there has been a strong suggestion over the years that the Booker favors male writers. And I have done a bit of research. And I can tell you that in the 50 years, 33 men have won it and 17 women, so that's two to one. If we take shortlisted writers, 155 auth male authors have been shortlisted, 104 female authors, so that's three-fifths three to two-fifths. But the key is that publishers who can who can submit whoever they want, uh, submit 60% male authors and 40% female authors. And that, I think, is a quite striking statistic. And in the years of the mid-90s, uh, there were four years, four quite extraordinary years, uh, when it was 6 to 0, 5 to 1, 5 to 1, and 6 to 0. And the outcome of that was the Orange Prize. That is exactly when the Orange Prize was founded for um, the very, very good reason that it was clear the Booker was, was uh, not, not for any particular conscious or political reason, but men were coming out uh, on top. Eleanor, as a woman, what do you say to this? <laughs> well, I mean, my, my book is mostly about men, really. Yes. Um, there are... Uh, Two women. Um, <laughs> there are, I, I made the decision to structure the novel around the, um, the kind of the scheme of the the classical heavens. Um, and so of the, the, the 20 main characters, 12 of, 12 of them, all men, are each archetypal of one of the 12 signs of the zodiac. Um, there are then seven planetary characters who kind of move in and out of these zodiacal characters' lives. And then lastly, one, um, uh, another man whose, whose death kind of forms the point on Earth that's, that kind of generates this kind of projection, I suppose. Um, and there, there were, there were uh, historical reasons for doing that. I, the, the book is set in New Zealand um, in the 1860s at a time, oh, uh, during one of New Zealand's gold rushes, at a time when uh, men did outnumber women um, at this particular part of the country by a ratio of about 10 to 1. So it was actually kind of perfect um, um, for, for the scheme that I wanted to, 
put into play. Um, but also, I think that we only, we, we kind of readily identify the principle of um, uh, Venus, kind of the idea of um, desire and um, uh, um, sens kind of sensuality, I suppose, and the principle of the moon, the idea of hiddenness and changefulness, the, the kind of the, the self that's kept back rather than the self that's, that's um, uh, asserted or performed. I think we, are, we of, of all of the, the figures of the classical heavens, we associate those with, um, with, with, with women very, very kind of naturally, mm -hmm. where we don't really, I think that we, we lack a language in our culture to talk about female ambition um, and female um, um, anger and, uh, um, you know, other, other kinds of um, a aspects of, of, of the principles that yeah. were in play. Do you um, think the Women's Prize, as it's now called, used to be the Orange, then briefly the Baileys, now the Women's Prize, is a good thing? I, I think any, any, kind mm. of, um, any kind of celebration of literature is a good thing, and any, any, any enterprise that results in people asking the question, what are we doing this for, and, and um, what, what, what matters in literature, and... Yeah. and um, what does it all mean? You know, I think I think those yeah. things are always a good thing. Yeah. Um, but I but I do think that there, you know, we we do have a we live in a sexist world, and we live in a world where um, the the same uh, behaviours, when presented by certain people over other certain uh, other people, are likely to be taken more seriously. And so it does make sense to me that the booker would it, that, that would bear out in the booker's history. Um, but I don't, I don't think it, it, it has to be this, that way. This pattern, it's not as if the, the pattern is more male-dominated uh, in the earlier years and has changed. It hasn't really changed at all. Stuart, not, mm. not in your year, but generally, would you say that the booker has favoured male authors? Oh, I think so, yes. Yeah. Uh, although I would say that um, in not one single meeting we had as a judging panel, was the issue of gender or nationality or class ever raised. Not once. Mm -hmm. uh, and I always said afterwards, because we got a bit of flack from certain newspapers, uh, because it was the most diverse Booker shortlist, and mm -hmm. long list, in fact, um, about how this was just political correctness gone mad. Um, the whole point was we never talked about these issues. And if you strive for quality, what I found, having judged many different prizes, if you go for quality, what you get is equality. Um, and I think there has been a bit of a blinkered nature. And part of that is just who is actually being submitted for the prize. And that's a really, you know, having spoken to several publicists when they were saying, you know, should we put forward Eleanor Catton or should we put forward this book and should it be on the call-in list and should it be on the ones that we just hope the judges figure out about? You know, that's where the problem lies. Mm. Um, yeah, I, th I think the most uh, striking statistic here is that 60% uh, of the books that publishers uh, submit mm -hmm. to the prize are by, by male authors. It's in the publisher's hands to do something about it. Although, that. as an agent, Derek, I mean, the number of times I've heard uh, slight stories about authors who insist in their contract that their book be submitted for the booker. No. I know you would never do that, oh. but... <laughs> No, you just bring as much pressure as you possibly can on the publisher to su submit your author. Sure, sure. Um, let's talk about um, the, the recent uh, rule change, which uh, meant that American authors were now eligible. So um, the prize for m most of its history has been for writers from Britain and the Commonwealth and Ireland. Um, we created uh, the Man Booker International Prize uh, and that is a prize for books in translation from other, other languages that have been published in English in this country. And uh, we came to the conclusion that the way to mirror, best to mirror this, was to have a prize open to authors writing in the English language, irrespective of where they came from. But the obvious category of authors that that let in was the Americans. 
And an awful lot of people, particularly, of course, British and Commonwealth writers, were very unhappy about that. So um, I would like to ask you both for your disinterested view of that. Now, Ellie, I think you've changed your mind, haven't you? Yeah, actually, when, when it was proposed, I was in favor of the idea. Um, in in the, the, the shortlist on the year that I was up, uh, most of us had connections to America. Um, Colm Toy Bean lives in America part-time. Jhumpa Lahiri is Amer an American citizen. Ruth Ezeki, an American citizen. I studied creative writing in America. Like We all, we all had a kind of a, 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 a profoundly literary connection to the country. And so it seemed kind of arbitrary that we were putting this fence around um, part of the English-speaking world as though, as though what they were doing, what, what American authors were doing was somehow different. Um, but I think that I, I have changed my mind on it. I think that, um, you know, the, the prize is adjudicated through Britain and the, the publishers who are eligible to submit are British publishers, publishers based in London mostly. And I think that prior to the, um, but prior to allowing the Americans to, um, uh, to um, into the prize, there was a kind of a very, I mean, you, you, you mentioned empire before. I felt, feel like there was something very imperial about it, that a very kind of, um, kind of the old Commonwealth. Um, we, we were all speaking the same history in a way. Yeah. And I think that there is something very peculiar about America as a country, the United States, I should say, as a country, and that there's this kind of um, self-enclosed quality to it as a culture, a kind of almost a kind of a virgin birth quality to it as a as a culture, as though as though American yeah, but as though democracy was invented by Americans, yeah. as though freedom yeah. was invent invented yeah. by Americans, and I think that what it means is that the literature is not necessarily in conversation with literatures outside of its own country. Mm. Um, and I think of the two American winners, which I thought were both absolutely fantastic books. Um, and I was really pleased that both of them won, actually. Um, the Sellout and uh, Lincoln and the Bardo. They w neither of them, I think, were, were concerned with any kind of non-American way of being. No, sure. w whereas I feel like that's actually slightly different with 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 Commonwealth writing, I think mm. that, that we're 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 talking in the same kind of post-imperial language yeah. in a way that, that it, it it does seem like there's there's a difference to me okay. between contemporary American fiction and and contemporary fiction written in English that's from elsewhere in the Anglosphere. Stuart, what do you think? I think it was simply that the rule was arbitrary. It would have meant things like Elif Shafak, the Turkish novelist who writes in English, was ineligible for the Man Booker Prize. Now, it's not just about the Americans. That was what all the brouhaha was about. Uh, there were plenty of other places where people are writing in English but were ineligible. And even the year that I did it, it was Britain, Ireland, the Commonwealth, but also Zimbabwe, which is no longer in the Commonwealth. Mm. In fact, Nevilet mm. uh was from Zimbabwe. Now, if, if the rules are so riddled with contradictions and errors, then I think you either do something universal mm. or you completely withdraw and say it's just going to be a prize for UK writers. Uh, and I would always be on the side of having as mm. broad a field as possible. I, well, think I, think I, I think I might have just changed my mind back again. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's, a, that's a really good point. Ah, the power of rhetoric. <laughs> oh, well. um, I think our feeling was that, that, and I hope I won't offend anybody's sensibilities here, the Commonwealth is a bit of a dead letter. It doesn't really mean very much anymore. To add Ireland and to exclude Zimbabwe and so on is all a bit odd. And that we now have two prizes that perfectly complement each other. There's a rationale to it. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes asking uh, Eleanor to talk about her work before we ask for questions. And I'm going to ask for questions a little earlier than usual because we've got a little, a little bonus uh, which Eleanor is going to give us at the very end of the session. Um, Eleanor, your two novels uh, demonstrate a great, great interest in narrative form. In the rehearsal, you have a, a bunch of teenagers in a theater group, uh, enacting in a very direct way 
the story of a, uh, a sexual assault case, which has just taken place, actually taken place in the school. Uh, so you have the, 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 the case itself, and then you have the way uh, the teenagers are dealing with it. Um, in the luminaries, you've, uh, you've taken a lot of the apparatus of the classic Victorian sensationalist novel. Uh, you've added astrology in a most uh, intriguing and precise way. Um, would it be fair to say that you like to uh, observe conventions in order to subvert them? Oh, yeah, I love that. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I, I love what you're saying about the uh, kind of the, the goal of the project of the novel writer should be to increase um, what, what, what the novel can do to kind of make the form more capacious. Um, that to me is just the most exciting prospect in the world, really. I'm, I'm never happier than when I'm inside a paragraph. <laughs> and you've spoken <laughs> about the, um, the conflict, as it were, between structure and plot. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. I think that um, I'm really interested in plot. I think that, uh, that um, in, in the course of the 20th century, um, or probably starting maybe slightly before the beginning of the 20th century, we saw a real kind of separation of, of high and low in literature, where what we understand to be high are kind of novels that the, where not a lot of, not a lot of change happens. Um, people might come to terms with the um, kind of fatalism of their lives in this kind of very poetic and um, kind of stately way, but you, you can generally expect from a work of literary fiction that nobody's going to... Um, you know, be stabbed in a glorious way, or nobody's going to explode, or, uh, um, or you know, um, or, uh, other kinds of um, highly kind of plotted and mechanical um, uh, events are going to take place. And it seems to me that we've we're, we're really we're really missing something. Um, that the that there's a there's a whole dimension to what the novel can do, and how how useful the no novel can be as a as a moral. Um, uh, investigative tool um, that, 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 that I, I, I feel like this the separation of high and low is not is not doing service to that so I'm quite interested in exploring how going back to more traditional ways of looking at form and kind of losing some of this cultural snobbery that that comes to do with um, whenever we we see a plot we kind of imagine that automatically that the the, the book is is a kind of a lesser object that it's it's for the people or something. It's not for the. It's not for the elites, and I just think that that's such rubbish. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I'm really interested in my career and trying to, in trying to reverse that, I suppose. Um, in the in the luminaries, you have epigraphs at the beginning of each chapter, and the uh, in the way that Dickens used to love, and uh, they start out very short, and chapters are very long, and then as the book progresses, they change places. So that at the end. The last epigraph is longer than the chapter that follows it. Um, what were you doing there? Oh well, um, I had this idea. I was really, I've been really in love with the golden ratio for a long time, um, uh, the, the kind of the golden mean, and I wanted to work the golden mean into the novel in some way because there's the um, the novel's very much about uh, the relationship between fate and the will, and um, the events of the of the luminaries were dictated in a way from the movements of the skies, uh, of the stars through the sky, uh, in, in in the period when when it was set. Um, it's not a historical novel in the sense of being um, about real characters or um, uh, a kind of fictionalization of real events, but it is historical in the sense that um, the the first chapter, for example, be begins Mercury and Sagittarius, and if you were in this part of New Zealand on the 27th of January 1866 and you'd looked up into the sky you would have indeed seen that Mercury was in the planet of uh, was in the, the, the constellation of Sagittarius and so I using using those I, I was kind of I, I wanted to work the golden ratio in it into it somehow um, I, I don't know if I just to explain the golden ratio it's it's, so, it's such a beautiful idea that the um, many, most books and most doorways are in golden ratio it's this uh, 
uh, proportion, I suppose, that we automatically associate with beauty in this very mysterious way. Um, but the way to understand it is that the, the short is to the long what the long is to them both. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I thought, oh, what a, what a beautiful way of understanding a relationship. So rather than looking at a person who you love and saying, I am to you what you are to me, which is always a little bit bogus, I, I, I feel. Instead, to look at them and say, I am to you what you are to our relationship. It's, that's, suddenly, that's so exciting. <laughs> so I thought, oh, great, I'll write this novel based on the golden ratio. And I'll, what I really wanted was for each chapter to stand in golden proportion to the, to the next. So I got super excited. I put it all into my computer and kind of worked it all out and came up with a novel that was much, much longer than War and Peace, <laughs> which is very, very long. I mean, that would be about probably three times the length of this book. So I thought, oh, I don't know if I have that in me. Um, but I wanted to, to, to preserve this sense of kind of, um, you know, the, the, the golden spiral kind of dwindling down and down and never, never quite arriving at something that's irreducible. Um, and so the, using these chapter headings and the dwindling chapters mm -hmm. became a way of, of um, working mm -hmm. that in, really. I should say to anyone who hasn't read this book that uh, despite this, this uh, exactitude, this is a page turner. It has murder, lust, greed, uh, everything, everything that Wilkie Collins and uh, Dickens put into, the, into their novels. Um, Eleanor, you are adapting the novel at the moment for the BBC and working title. I have, yeah. And you are the sole scriptwriter, which is very unusual. It is, um, yeah, as I've just and I recently think discovered. You're yeah. going to turn the whole thing inside out. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's, um, so it's going to be six uh, hours. It'll be a six hour miniseries on BBC Two. Um, and I really kind of fell into it, um, uh, not really knowing anything about screenwriting at all. I watch a lot of television, and I like um, I, I like television a lot. Um, but naively, just thought I would give it a go, and realised pretty quickly how what a completely untranslatable in many ways mm. um, uh, novel this is, in the sense that so much of what makes it what it is has been dictated in a way that just is not translatable to the screen. Um, and, and, and what I've learned over the course of working on this show, which I've now been working on for longer than it took me to, to write the book, it's <laughs> adapting has taken almost a year longer now and counting, um, is that there, are, there really are, I think, inviolable laws in screenwriting. In, in the sense, I don't think that there... I would say that there aren't natural laws in, mm, in, sure. in, in fiction. I think you can break almost everything. It, almost every law you can break... If, you know, if, given the right circumstances. But I don't think the same is true in television. And I would say that the big kind of... Um, uh, the, the, the kind of important natural law just has to do with desire. Um, you, you have to know what you, the main character wants and you have to want, the, want it for them. And if you don't know what they want, you'll be confused and you'll hate the show. And if you don't want it for them, then you'll hate the character, which might be quite fun. So that, <laughs> that, 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 that could work. Um, but I think that that's, that's really, that, that's a kind of an unbreakable mm. um, principle of, of TV. So it's been quite fun to work, work in this different medium and it's, it's actually given me much more respect for, for the capaciousness of the novel and realizing, I mean, you're, you just have ultimate freedom as the novel, of, as, the, as, a, as a prose writer. You can make time and space move, you can collapse them or expand them in just any way you please. Um, whereas an hour of television, yeah. it has to be 50, 59 pages. You know, yeah. you, can't, you can't you can't mess with that. Um, you well, can't, I think, you, yeah. I think it's going to be another first yeah. for you because I can't. I really can't think of another novelist who has written a long novel and then adapted it into a six-part television series. I mean, who would that? No. Be? Who would I mean, that be? Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, Eleanor has a, a very lovely surprise for us at the very end of this of this. Uh, event. But what I'd like to do now is break off for questions, and they could be questions to any of us. So to Eleanor about her work, uh, or to Stuart or me. So, uh, yes, look. Martin. Wait. Is this working? Yeah. Um, just a Here's a, a, mic, a mic coming. Yeah. It's all been completely riveting and fascinating. It's just a very basic, almost mechanical question, which George's comment made me think of when you talked about who submits and why they submit and how that works. And I'm 
you know, been... Stuart's. Yeah, well, Stuart's, Stuart's question, you know, and watch the book or I'm interested in it. But I don't know who, how, who can, are publishers the only people who can submit? Yes. And do they have to pay an entry fee when they submit? Yes. Oh, yes, and they have to, well, I mean, one thing which I hadn't realised, having covered it for the best part of 20 years, was that our novels which were published purely in a digital form were, you know, could be submitted. The caveat is, if it gets onto a long list or a short list, they have to commit to paper publication. Um, it's like films have to be shown in fil in cinemas if they want to be submitted to the Oscars or those sorts of things. Well, it's at a later stage, I suppose. I mean, publishers yeah. can submit a certain number of books depending on their past performance in, in the book or in, in, in recent years. I mean, Is there a limit to the number of books they can submit? Five, and then there's uh, a call-in call -in list of another five. And the judges, how many books did you call in, Stuart, that weren't submitted? Well, we had to. Uh, it's it's absolutely it's in the rules. The year that I did it, that you had to take at least twelve from the call-in sheet, and that's always where things get a bit difficult because mm -hmm. you can have some publishers who will put. Um, you know, they'll realise that a particular author might be so famous that the judges will feel they have to call it in, uh, so they can put not their second stringers or their B team up, but you know, just on the off chance. Um, sure. So I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a dangerous game, which uh, I don't think publishers play anymore, actually. No, I mean, certainly the, uh, uh, who was it? Uh, I think it was when P.D. James was a judge. Uh, she refused to take anything from the call-in sheet uh, <laughs> and said, if the publishers don't know what their best book is, it's yeah, not for us sure. to change. Yeah. Yeah. Another question. The um, creation of the Orange Prize was because 60% of the books were um, submitted were by men. But what's the percentage of books that are published that are written by men and women? Do you know? Oh, uh, it's, it's, it's in, in literary fiction, it's, it's slightly more women than men. Fiction generally, with, I mean, the distinction between popular and literary fiction is one we can, we can sit and talk about for the rest of the day. Uh, but in, in fiction overall, uh, it's predominantly women. It's at least 60, 40 women to men, I would think. Yeah. Uh, one more question. No? Yes, one more here. Uh, only I think she's only been once. Only once. She only was once. on. Yeah. As, as P, you mentioned, P.D. James, was that the judging you panel? You can generally you only do it once. There are right, one okay. or two exceptions, but you can only do it once. Okay. There, yeah, I mean, there's there's only a few exceptions. So something like Robin McFarlane, who was uh, the chair of judges in my year, he yeah, he was, had been a judge. You can he, be a judge and then a chair, but you yeah. can't do the other way around. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, he. Oh. The year that Sarah Hall and yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. It's, it's just my sister and I were really rooting for P.D. James one year um, for the book. You mean as an author? As an author. As an author, yeah. And you know, again, you seem to have turned your back on crime fiction. Hugely. Well, I, I, I have <laughs> I'm to say, blaming you for everything. This is I have the closest to, I've got. I have <laughs> to say that uh, when Eleanor won it, uh, and I went back to my hotel room, I got a text from my friend Ian Rankin, just saying. Thank goodness you gave it a crime novel for once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was going to say, with the, it's on my list. It's on my okay. list of things to read. Thank you. Um, we're going to end with uh, Eleanor reading uh, not, not only from her new work in progress, from but, but something that was a work in progress on the train coming here <laughs> from Cambridge today, uh, which I think makes you very brave. Um, and I just want, before you start on your latest work, I just want to remind you of a sentence in your first work of fiction, which you wrote at the age of nine. And your favorite sentence in this is, the moon slipped out from behind a cloud 
heedless of oblivion. <laughs> and and Eleanor, never top there. If, yeah. if you only knew how many manuscripts cross literary agents' desks <laughs> with sentences <laughs> like this. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Eleanor's new novel, uh, which she's writing now, is called Burnham Wood, and we're going to get a preview. Over to you. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, this might be... Um, please don't record this. I, oh, I don't know. If, oh, I guess we're recording it. This, this may change before publication. Um, so I'm going to read... Um, I've got an epigraph to the book that I will read because this, this is almost the sum total of the manuscript and the epigraph increases my word count significantly, so I'm quite proud of it. Um, it's from Macbeth, of course, and the, um, uh, the quote is, the third apparition says to Macbeth, be lion-mettled, proud, and take no care who chafes, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burn Burnham Wood to high Dunsinane Hill shall come against him. And Macbeth replies, that will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree unfix his earthbound root? The Kordawai Pass had been closed since the end of the summer, when a burst of shallow quakes along the Alpine Fault buried a stretch of the highway in rubble, killing three and sending a long-haul transport truck over a precipice where it exploded on a viaduct below. The quakes continued for many days after the accident, and it was weeks before the bodies could be safely recovered and the wrecked vehicles airlifted away. By this time, the temperature was dropping and the days shortening fast. Nothing could be done before the spring. The road was cordoned off on either side of the pass and traffic diverted to the west around the far shore of Lake Korowai and to the east through a patchwork of farmland to the braided rivers that flowed down over the plains towards the sea. The town of Thorndike, located just north of the pass in the foothills of the Korowai Ranges, was bounded on one side by the lake and on the other by the back end of Korowai National Park. The closure of the pass created an effective cul-de-sac. Cut off from the south, the township was now contained in all directions but one. Like much of small-town New Zealand, the local economy depended absolutely on the commerce of truckers and tourists passing through. And when the rescue teams and television crews finally packed up and drove away, many Thorndike residents left with them. The cafes and trinket shops along the highway frontage began one by one to close. The petrol station reduced its hours. An apologetic sign appeared in, in the window of the visitor centre. And the former dairy farm at the head of the valley, which for several months had been the town's most promising subdivision prospect, was quietly withdrawn from sale. It was this last that caught the attention of Mira Bunting, aged 24, a horticulturalist by training and the founder of an activist collective known among its members as Burnham Wood. Mira had never been to Thorndike and had neither the intention nor the means to purchase even the smallest patch of land there, but she had earmarked this particular listing when it had first appeared online some four or five months prior. Under an alias, she had written to the realtor, registering her interest and requesting to be notified in the event the farm was sold. The alias, June Crowther, was one that she had used before. <laughs> Mrs. Crowther was imaginary. She was also 68, retired and profoundly deaf, for which reason she preferred to be contacted by email rather than by phone. She had a modest nest egg and shares and bonds that she wished to convert to real estate. A holiday home was what she had in mind, somewhere rural, which could be shared among her daughters while she was living and bequeathed to them after she was gone. The house must be new. After a lifetime of repairs and renovation, she was done with all of that. But it need not be purpose-built. A smart prefab on a subdivision would suit her very well, so long as the neighbours were not too close and she was free to choose the colours. All this the farm at Thorndike might have promised. Some five weeks after the closure of the pass, however, Mrs Crowther received an email from the realtor explaining that owing to the change in circumstances, his client had decided not to sell. It was possible the acreage would return to market at a later date. In the meantime, he hoped Mrs. Crowther would be interested in similar listings nearby and wished her all the best for the future. Mira read this email twice, wrote a courteous but non-committal reply, and then logged out of the fake account and called up a map of Thorndike in her browser. The realtor had not dis disclosed his client's name, but when she typed the address into a separate tab, 
a news article came up at once. Owen Darvish of 1606 Quarterway Pass Road, Thorndike, South Canterbury, had recently made headline news. He had been named in the Queen's Birthday Honours List and was shortly to be created Knight Companion of the New Zealand Order of Merit for services to the economy. Intrigued, Mira forgot about the farm for a moment and read on. Chivalric titles had been abolished in New Zealand in the year 2000, only to be reinstated nine years later by a canny politician who knew the value of a royal touch. It was embarrassing whichever way one felt about it. The monarchists could not celebrate as the resurrection only proved that monarchy had been politically compelled, and the republicans could not censure it because to do so would be to suggest that there was something sacred about a monarchic code of chivalry in the first place that ought to be beyond a common politician's reach. Both parties felt disgruntled, and both now read the twice-yearly honours lists with the same jaded cynicism, feeling jointly that all the knighted artists were, were hypocrites and all the knighted bus businessmen were shells. Owen Darvish seemed to be a rare exception. The news of his, his elevation had come so soon after the landslide on the pass that one could not help suspecting that the honour had been bestowed as a kind of consolation to the Kōrowai region at large, and that was a kind of chivalry with which neither monarchists nor republicans were prepared to find fault. Darvish had begun his working life 40 years ago at the age of 17. He was a very good shot, and his two most treasured possessions, both presents from his father, were his 22 air rifle and his skinning knife, which had a fixed blade and a boxwood handle, in which he still kept oiled and sharpened in a sheath on his belt. Rabbits were his specialty. As the son of a slaughterhouse worker, he knew firsthand that large numbers of healthy livestock had to be prematurely butchered each year on account of a broken angle, ankle or a broken leg. Rabbit warrens laid waste to good pasture. They were also an introduced species, along with possums and stoats, which shared a taste for the shoots of native plants and the eggs of native birds. The extinction of these pests was one of the few instances of common ground between conservationists and industrial farmers, and Darvish, as he expanded operations, steered a middle course, courting clients on both the left and the right. The, the approach appeared to have paid off. Within a decade, Mira read, Darvish pest control was nationwide. Darvish had been a millionaire by the age of 40. By 50, he owned a beach house, house on both islands and had part shares in a yacht. By his 58th birthday, he would be Sir Owen, an anointed knight. The picture on the cabinet website showed a clean-shaven, open-collared man with a wide, capable mouth, a strong jaw, and an amused expression. The citation below it praised qualities of ingenuity, tenacity, and clear-sighted pragmatism, casting him as a near-perfect exemplar of what New Zealanders were flattered to describe as the national temperament. In interviews, he played expertly to type, fielding questions in a manner that was bluff and self-effacing, and asserting when asked about his politics that he had none at all. Mira could not find a single article dispraising him. He presented as a patriot, a staunch, self-sufficient, adamantly informal man, doting in his enthusiasms, nostalgic in his routines, and innately suspicious about all partisan displays, though tolerant, perhaps, of a little recreational church going in his wife. <laughs> she, Jill, soon to be Lady Darvish, looked rather like Mira's mother, tall, slim, with a tanned complexion and silver hair and a pixie cut. She was a property developer by profession who specialized, according to her website, in converting high country hill stations into luxury retreats. Among her clientele were several names to conjure with, all of them foreign and all very rich. Mira scanned the page only briefly. An idea had taken hold. Her knee had started to bounce underneath the table, and she felt excitement rising in her chest. She returned to the cabinet website and read that the investiture of Owen Darvish was to take place at Government House in Wellington in two weeks' time. She noted down the date, then closed her laptop, picked up her cycle helmet, and walked out of the library. Um, thank you, Elena. Um, what you couldn't tell from that very smooth presentation was what I could tell from, uh, from looking over your shoulder, how much of it had been scrawled out. 
Um, we've come to the end. Uh, there are two things I'd like to say about uh, Eleanor. One is that she is doing several events uh, next weekend at the South Bank relating to 50 years of the Booker Prize. Uh, and the other is that she will be signing copies of the luminaries. I'm not sure about the rehearsal, actually. But anyway, the luminaries uh, in the book tent, or rather in the bandstand. Is that right? Great. Uh, would you join me in thanking Eleanor and Stuart? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.